What's up? What's up, everyone? Tallest podcast on earth. Uh, today we we are gonna do a Q and A. Um, if we can get, I don't know, for some reason, every time I try to do a solo podcast, not through Zoom, there's always something going on with the audio quality. But you know what? We're not letting it stop us, okay? Because months ago, for years, it stopped me, and not anymore. Got coffee hot. Out the uh, out the microwave. I'll be honest. I mean, I made it earlier, but it, dude, coffee just doesn't stay warm long enough for when you want to drink it. It's the most annoying thing. I'll make coffee and it'll sit in the French press for like twenty minutes, thirty minutes, and then that's it. Just goes to Luke. Goes from hot to Luke too quickly. Wish there was a better solution. If you got any solutions to keep coffee hot, you know, actually, I was thinking of something the other day. I would love. Now you could just do a lid and I've seen those like old English style mugs that have the little topper that comes on. It'd be great if they made something like really sleek that like slid over the coffee just to keep it warm and then slid back, you know, kind of like a moon roof, coffee moon roof. That would be cool. All right, let's just get right into it. Um, I asked on my Instagram, T April 13, if you guys had any questions, you did. Uh, I'll be honest. I was really hoping for some kind of shoot over the moon questions, you know, some really some wild, some ball pit questions. Um, but regardless, I said I'd answer him. So we're going to answer him. So here we go. Real simple. All right. First is by Harry Edwards, the 57th. How can I be a faster on swing blocking? Um, first of all, if you haven't checked out my course, Go check it out, youwon't.com. I made a middle blocking course to solve all of these problems. And I know, I feel like as of recently, I've been kind of basically saying like, hey, go check out the course. It's because that's why I made it. I made it to not have to answer all of these questions about, everyone has the same questions about blocking, about attacking, about jumping. So my goal is to make courses to answer your questions. So that way your questions are answered and I don't have to, talk back and forth about answering questions. But to help you there, uh, the simple answer is learn how to split step. If you need it, split step is basically just going from here and then right as the ball is entering the setter's hands, just taking a little split and then reacting. Tennis players do it. That's where we see it a lot. And they're the best at reacting laterally, arguably. So stole it from them and uh, it works. And in the course, we study the best middles in the world. All of them do it. They've all adopted it and arguably never trained it. So check out the course. Otherwise, check out split stepping. Oh, man. God, I hate to bring this up in the very beginning of this. But, dude, I don't know what's up with this audio. I'm getting some feedback. If we make it through this podcast with this feedback, I'm, this is going to be – we're just going to push through it, you guys. So thank you for being here with me. All right. Have you ever wanted to walk away from pro volleyball? What makes all the sacrifices worth it? Have I ever wanted to walk away from it? I mean, other than literally all the time. I, <laughs> I don't I guess I don't really mean that. All right, have you ever wanted to walk away from pro volleyball? I mean, yeah, definitely. There's times where, let's put it this way. I think it's like anything you do in life, you know? You, you first, like when you first play as a kid, you just fall in love with it because it's just so much fun. It's all you want to do. It's all I wanted to do. And that's how I spent my time, just doing what I wanted to do as a kid. And then you get older and you play in college and it's still like all you want to do, but then there's like social life and then there's school and there's some other things that you're interested in, surfing, whatever. And then you go play professionally and then you literally leave all of your balance, all of your other parts of your life, you leave them for the most part. And you go pursue the one thing, which is volleyball. The only reason I'm in Poland is to play volleyball. And you do that year in after year after year. And yeah, after a while, it's just like, dude, what am I doing? It just starts to feel like routine. You lose that childlike curiosity. Um, and I think my, my quest now has been like, how can I restore, regain some of that childlike curiosity for what I'm doing. Because if I want to continue to excel, I have to have that. I have to have that curious nature. Um, and it, it, you know, it comes with ups and downs. I think sometimes, you know, when you're playing really well, your team's doing good, everyone's happy. You're just, and you're playing games a lot. So there's not a lot of downtime. I mean, that's when it's just the best. 
um, where things get tough, the more realistic situation is you have some sort of an injury or your coach sucks or your teammates are not great or guys just want to go home or you're not going to make playoffs or you're having a shitty year or whatever, you know, that's when things get tough. That's when you need balance. That's why you need relationships and you need things to be interested in outside of volleyball. So, uh, what makes all the sacrifices worth it? I mean, I just, I still love what I get to do. It doesn't take away from the fact that I love what I do. Um, and quite honestly, as I've gotten older, that's why I started some of these things is because, uh, volleyball isn't enough for me. It's not just, it's not enough. It's not who I am. You know, it's a big part of who I am. Um, but it's not all of me. And so a part of this journey is sharing some of that and also giving back another part of me that we're learning. You know, I was a selfish kid for most of my life. Not that that's always a bad thing, but you know, I'm trying my best now to really give back to the community, volleyball community that gave me so much. So let's not get too sentimental here, but that's my story. Okay. Next question. Oh, that was also by August Lee. What a next Jack underscore DT. How do you adjust your game to hit or block against taller middles? Well, that's a great question out here in Poland. Everyone's taller than me. All of the middles I've ever faced here. I feel like are bigger than me actually are. Um, I mean, honestly, I don't think too much about my opponent. There's some things I like to know. What's his style of blocking? Does he jump a lot? Does he read a lot? A lot of that you can also figure out during the game while you're playing, but you know, a strategy that's worked for me and I think is arguably the most important thing to learn, especially starting as a middle is being fast on the ball, being fast with your feet, being fast with your arm. If you have good speed and they're read blocking, you're going to beat them every time, even if they are tall. Um, that's just the truth. You see lots of, lots of guys succeeding. one of my best friends, Matteo Piano, Italian national team, the guy's made a career on just being fast on the ball. Um, offensively that is, he's made a career cause he's seven feet tall and he blocks everything. Um, but he just is so fast on the ball. He doesn't have huge range. He's just hits straight pretty much, but he's so quick on the ball and you're not going to want to commit with a guy who you don't think is like destroying balls. So no one commits with him and he scores a lot because of it. So that's my simple answer. Next here. How can you slide easier on a volleyball court? Crisco, baby. We've seen it time in and time in time, time in and time again, time after time. Fuck. I don't know how they say it, but if you're trying to slide, Crisco seems to be the winner for that. I don't know if you guys ever play, I think like old church camps we used to play where you, you take a watermelon and you fill it with Crisco or you, you lather it in Crisco and you have to like pass it down a line, some childhood game, childhood game, some childhood church game. Um, let me tell you, it's hard to grip. You know, I can only imagine delivering a baby. That's gotta be pretty tough too. Um, so I would say either some of that baby juice or some of that Crisco, uh, that'll help you slide for sure. That was by Matthew Chilista. All right. Next question by Jeffrey Liu. Uh, I'm going to butcher all these names. I don't give a fuck if I butcher them. I'm just going for it. Should I play through knee pain if I know it's not an injury? Uh, what? what an interesting way to word that. Like I have pain, but it's not an injury. Great question. Actually, what is an injury, right? Like what do you define as an injury? Um, and look, the truth is guys are playing through, let's say in quotes, injuries all the time. There's always seems that there's some little thing in your back and your shoulder and your knee and your foot, whatever. And to that point, yeah. At what point is it? Hey, I need to shut it down. And I think a lot of that is just listening and knowing your body. Some of that takes a long time. Some of it is what's the guidance, what resources do you have? Use your resources, um, to ask questions and, you know, try to understand what it's not. Look, if you have an injury and you're like, ah, oh, can I, it's knee pain, but like, is it an injury or can I just play through it? I think the first thing you need to think about is what's causing the pain and start to, to understand like, how are you moving? What are some things you can start supplementing either daily movements? Um, I will say from having knee pain, I started sledding also cause I have, I've had plantar fasciitis. And so I started trying to strengthen my big toe. And so the backwards sled, I really enjoy because you're kind of strengthening your feet and your knees. And I just do five minutes a day, like really simple. I try to make things, really simple. And for a handful of injuries for shoulders, I just hang, I hang five minutes a day, minimum after practice. If I have a weight session, I'll do some scat pull-ups. I really like a lot of scap work for shoulder stuff, a lot of hanging. 
Um, just finding simple solutions and understanding when is it, trying to understand early what type of injury is it and how, how is the way I'm moving affecting this injury? Um, I'm also not like a certified, I don't know, doctor. I'm not a certified doctor. Okay. So don't listen to me. The fuck do I know? Um, but that's my advice. Okay. Sick. Next Madagascar official, uh, tips to get back in shape to go back overseas after time off. Yeah, I think I'm assuming you're, you've played for a handful of years. So you have, you know, your bank is, is full of, uh, volleyball movements of some strength and conditioning. You have some stuff banked in there. So I think like anything, start slow. You just got to, you have to start slow and it's hard when you come back from an injury or when you come back from not playing for a month, two months, weeks, your initial reaction is like, Oh, I feel so good. And I will say every time I've taken a break, like say I'm just healthy and I take a two weeks, three weeks, four weeks off. I'm like, Oh my God, this is my future body. Just like constantly pain-free and jello-y and feeling good. Um, but when you're playing volleyball six days a week, year round, you don't always get that luxury. So I think you have to put your ego aside a little bit and be like, okay, this is the science of how, you know, how you build resilience. And that's just step by step layering brick by brick. So just start slow. Um, as you listen to your body, as you progress, turn it up, baby. Um, and this is, if you want to reach out to me for a more specific answer, it really depends. Like how much time do you have? Uh, how much time did you take off? What were you doing before that? There's a lot of questions that go into an answer like this. So I don't want to give a blank statement. All right. Next Lena Marie double zero. What do you do before a game starts? Um, well, I've posted about this before. My, my routine is, is, uh, pretty simple and I'll just, we'll cut to like 30 minutes before a game just to make things not overwhelming here. Um, my simple practice is having a prepared before the game, understanding what I'm going to do in certain situations. Um, but I start off with a, with a meditation and I do, I do a meditation, a visualization and breath work. And sometimes the order changes, but the meditation visualization is a two part thing. And arguably the breath work is also like a meditation. So it's kind of like a three, two, four part thing. Um, but yeah, it's basically just, you know, I start off and I just 30 minutes before if, if, and it gets tricky. Cause if we meet in the locker room and I only have 15 minutes, sometimes I'll have to do some of this stuff at the hotel and I'll save just the breath work or I'll save just the visualization. But let's assume you have 30 minutes of your own time before you guys meet as a team and then go off and play. I think the first thing I do is, oh, pigeon just landed right here in front of my uh, the first thing I do is, um, I meditate. So for me, that's just being aware of my surroundings, closing my eyes. And then I do just kind of a body scan. Just take note. How does my, you know, uh, what does my body feel like on this Jersey? What do my go all the way from my head, my hair sticking to my head my ears, just knowing that they're going to grow forever. I just found out the other day that ears don't stop growing. So I'll probably think about that for a second and how giant they're going to be when I'm like 80, if I make it there. Um, but then I just scan all the way down my body and kind of take note if there's some injury or some pain or something, just like sensing it and letting it go. And then go all the way down to my toes, do a few breaths where I'm just focusing on like, what does the air feel like as it hits my nostril? And what does it feel like when it comes out my mouth? Um, and then once I've kind of done a little meditation, I go straight into a visualization and I start with what's next. I start with walking onto the court, what it looks like. I start with what it feels like, what I'm going to do. Am I going to play some soccer a little bit? Am I going to, you know, what stretches, what movements am I going to do? Kind of walk like briskly through the things I'm going to do. And then leading up to blocking trips, leading up to uh, hitting lines a little bit. And then I just go straight into, okay, I'm at the net blocking. What am I seeing? And I'll picture a rotation sometimes like rotation one. What am I seeing? Okay. Who's their priority? What am I going to do? What am I going to communicate? Um, and then I like to picture, I like to picture like me just destroying. So it's like balls, 10 foot line, balls, three meter line sets outside me, stop short, drop hand, bam, block, like just, fuck you, you know, getting stoked. 
Um, but then always my brain always finds a way to just fuck with me. So then it, it'll all of a sudden be like, you know, I don't know, I'm going to attack the ball and I hit it under the net. And if my brain decides to do that, actually that happens a lot with serving. Sometimes I'll visualize myself serving under the net because my brain just always is working on the worst case scenario. Hats off to you brain preparing me for the best and the worst. Um, and so a lot of times I'll visualize like, all right, what's the worst thing that can happen? I play like shit. What does that look like? I get blocked. How am I going to respond? I serve under the net. How am I going to respond? Like who fucking cares? What if it happens? So what? And that helps a lot actually visualizing the negative side of things and visualizing my bounce back. My response is super been super helpful because it just makes me realize like I have nothing to fear. I worked super fucking hard to be here. And what I remind myself is the guy across the net, he's fucking not scared. I don't want to say scared, but he's thinking too, you know, he wants to play good. There's some anxiety always, a little bit of excitement, let's say, before any game. And uh, for myself, it's like I have to remind myself like fucking you're the shit. And in fact, that's how I finish my visualization is a little bit of pumping myself up and just, you know, it looks different every time. But sometimes I'll stand. Actually, there's some science to show that standing like with your hands on your hips does something for you physiologically, boosts your T probably, who knows? Um, but I'll just be like, man, you're the shit. And I try now not to, like, I, I don't think I'm, a, I'm definitely not a cocky player, but in my head, I sure have to be, I feel like, you know? Um, so I try to be, I try to be like, you know, I go through the worst and I go through the best, like fucking you deserve to be here. Picturing myself just like hammering balls, picturing myself like, serving and contacting and driving it where I want to and just being stoked, picturing myself just destroying. That's what I do. Okay, let's move on. Actually, let's say last part, breath work. Uh, sometimes I do box breathing. I use this app called State. I really like that a lot. Brian McKenzie, you can follow him on Instagram. Um, he's kind of a breathing expert, let's say, nasal breathing expert. And uh, I like learning a lot about that. I started taking a nasal breathing course because I just find it really fascinating. Um, how it's worked in my life and really enjoyed it um, and see a lot of benefits from it. And the breathing stuff is, you know, there's, I don't want to pretend I understand all the science. I will say it does make me feel a bit euphoric. It does get me super focused. Even the box breathing is a great place for all you guys to start at home. Box breathing is really simple. The cadence is one, 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 one. So it's breathe in, let's say for five seconds, hold for five seconds, breathe out for five seconds, hold for five seconds and the cycle continues. Um, sometimes I start with five and I go as high as I can. Sometimes I do rounds of 10, uh, five rounds of 10, whatever for like three to five minutes. Pretty simple. Um, and then go ball. Okay. Next question. What does the NVA slash VALL VLA have to do to start attracting higher tier athletes? Um, dude, I don't know. I really don't know. And I don't even want to dive into this, but probably more money, right? Dude, if the U S put out a league so many and it, and it paid like pretty decently, dude, so many European or worldwide players would want to come to the States. I hear it all the time. Guys want to come to the States so bad. So I don't know who's in charge of that kind of stuff, but fucking figure it out, make it happen. Cause I think also it would do a hell of a lot for a lot of, um, you know, American players as well. I would love to play in the States. If LA had like the fucking, I don't know, the Gators or whatever, I would be a Gator right away. You know, I'd paint my body into scales if I had to. Um, that'd be pretty sweet. How to get there. That's not for me to understand or to know. Okay. Uh, let's see. Julie Zanner, better to start on a bad team or be bench, but still keep playing. Okay. This is very confusing how you put this. I can only imagine English is not your first language, so I'll help you out here. Basically how I see this question is, is it better to go to a team where you're gonna start or is it better to go to a team where you're gonna be the third, let's say middle or outside, um, and probably just come in sometimes? To me, especially younger players, go where you can play. It's so simple. I have people ask me that actually, guys who are going pro and they have options to be a third somewhere, like maybe in a better league, or go play somewhere in not as good of a league. Go where you can play, go where you're the guy straight up. Because if you ball out, um, that's just how you work your way up. If you're a third and you're like kind of hoping someone gets injured or you have to, you're relying on other guys for your success. And I just think the best thing you can do is just go where you can control your future. Um, 
Yeah, that's what I think. I think uh, go where you can play. Real simple. Next question by Charlie Dickus. What's the future of the middle position? I don't know. The future of the middle position. I hope the future is that middles are just so skilled and talented. Middles, in fact, this like there's like this new hybrid serve, Bienek, this Polish dude started doing it. Uh, I see a lot of middles kind of changing up the serve now, having like a float with a spin. That's the future of middle serving, probably serving in general. Um, otherwise, I don't know. I, I really hope the future of middles is that middles don't specialize early, that they're volleyball players. I think that's huge. That was a huge part of my success is being a volleyball player first, having played as a setter and an opposite and an outside <clears throat> before eventually becoming a middle. And uh, I think that's what led to me having success as an undersized middle. And to be honest, I think and I really hope that, you know, especially big, tall, dorky middles that they just learn to have ball control, learn to play, play on the beach. Like a lot of that is coaching issues. Coaches need to allow more time for that kind of stuff. So that's the future. The future is that middles is the position where everyone relies on you. You're like the Wayne Gretzky's out there. You know, you got all the pressure. That's what I want. Give me the fucking pressure, baby. And that's what I hope that all the middles of the future want too. All right. Next is Nabayev Schult. How much physical preparation should you do on the day slash days before a game? Again, this is a really subjective question. It depends how much have you been doing? Where are you? How old are you? What's going on? Um, I try to keep, you know, especially now it's interesting, right? We're in playoffs. And so we have games every like three or four days. So it's easy to the day before is like travel, then there's game day. And then the next day is like kind of like an off day. And then there's one practice and then there's game day. It gets hard. It, you could you can lose some of the lifting stuff and you have to remind yourself like, okay, for example, now in playoffs, what am I lifting for? I'm not lifting to gain anything. I'm lif lifting to keep the system going, to keep reminding it. This is what we do. I, I focus more on like speed stuff. Um, I don't go as long. We don't need as much volume. So that's the, that's to me, that's the, um, that's the thought process, especially when it comes to playoffs, the end of the year, there's no need to like go super long. Um, just get in there, get some work done and focus really on the volleyball stuff, focus on the recovery stuff and just staying healthy. Bam. Oh, I hope my camera doesn't die. I can't tell if it's recording. Let's hope it's recording. Here we go. MC eight, five, Machenoweth five what's the over under on how many baguettes you've had in your life whoa i'll be honest with you i don't even know what over under really even means i've never really i don't really understand it at all so i'm just gonna say 10 over fucking two okay 10 over two um appreciate you bringing up baguettes i started something called free the baguette in france a while back it was really a hit i thought about trying to bring it back but I don't know. I just get so turned off when I just feel like it was just such a great idea and I should have done more with it and I didn't, which is why we're doing this kind of stuff now to make up for lost time. Okay. Next question. Real Jackal Michael San, uh, favorite Polish food. Really simple. It's called rolatki. Uh, it's basically like these sun dried tomatoes and zucchini that are just stuffed inside of a breast of a chicken. Um, Dude, that's fire. And I don't know what sauce they put some fire sauce on it, but that's also really fucking good. So that's, that's a obvious answer. Okay. Next question. Asmdian, asm.dian. Most important skill as a middle in your, in your opinion, in your opinion, most important skill. I kind of already went over it. Being fast on the ball is offensively the most important skill in my opinion. Um, I would say the next is re blocking. We all know that. Read blocking just takes a lot of time. But what people don't understand is read blocking isn't just a middle standing in the middle of the court trying to read the setter. Read blocking to me is also like, how well do you just read the game? Your volleyball IQ. So you can be read, you can be reading in any position, playing defense, you're reading what's going on. And I just think seeing the game as much as you can is the, the best way to really get better. Oh, so many volleyball questions. We'll keep it going here. Okay. Stefano underscore Scrocho. What are the main three things you want a coach to tell you and court with your teammates? Coach to tell you. That's an interesting question. 
I think some guys have a hard time dealing with coaches who yell. Some guys want to be told like, you know, serving is a great example, right? If someone's, let's say you miss your first serve and then you miss your second serve and then you're going back to your third serve. Do you want your coach telling you to float just to put it in? Are you thinking just put it in? Probably. Um, or do you want your coach being like, hey, just good toss, go for it. Here's what I will say. I'm not going to say the three things. I'll just say, I think the the best thing you can do and the best thing a coach can do for you is get tactical with you. If the coach wants to pull you out, he pulls you out. That's his decision. But I think as a coach, you know, being really getting your players to think tactically is just such a great strategy because it keeps them present. And we all know being present, it helps you stay in a flow and you just, you play better. Everyone knows that. Or if you don't, you're welcome. Um, but that's what I do. I, I try to stay tactical in my own mind, you know, all the time, anytime, like, for example, I get blocked, I go back. It's just like, all right, fast on the ball or like, all right, just like trying my best to, you know, or it's the same with blocking. I go, maybe I reach a little bit and the guy hits past me. I'm like, fuck, I got to stay disciplined. Like just be disciplined. And I'll tell myself out loud, you know, it's the, actually it's something I just started doing with serving is I started like when I walk back to serve, I just, cause I'm kind of doing this new, like five step hybrid toss, like float toss hybrid smash. Um, and so I'll say to myself, like the keys for me, it's reach high, fast step, close, good toss, go for it. You know? So if it's good toss, go for it and having solutions, you know, if it's a bad toss, learning how to roll. But the point is like, I'll say out loud to myself, the tactical things to work on. So I'm not thinking about, fuck, it's kind of a new serve. I don't feel super comfortable with it yet. I'm not thinking about the guy before me just missed. I got to put this one in. Like I do my best to be like, I mean, it is important to know also what's going on. If the guy before you, if two guys, the last two serves were misses, you're going to want to put it in. Um, but you can't just be thinking, put it in, put it in, put it in. You got to be a little more tactical. So maybe I'll purposely toss it behind myself. So I have to roll it a little bit. Um, but just staying tactical done. Next question by Mega Wolowich. How have your experiences impacted your mental health? Well, it's a great question. And uh, kind of talked about mental health stuff with Matt Anderson on the podcast we just did. Um, but you know, I, God, I don't, I don't want to be pessimistic about volleyball. I think it's such an amazing thing to play professionally is amazing, but I'll just say like, as you get older, you just realize that there's so much more to life than just volleyball, that volleyball isn't everything it's going to end. And I think that real in fact, the first time I ever dealt with like a serious, let's say, uh, not serious depression, but yeah, something like it is when I had knee surgery. And volleyball was stripped away from me. And I was like, who am I? You know, what else am I going to do? <laughs> and uh, that scared the shit out of me, you know. And you talk to a lot of players overseas. Like, they have fucking no idea what they're going to do when they're done. And yeah, you could just, like, go be a coach or whatever. But even that, the unknown is scary, you know. And so I think for a long time, even last year in Con, I dealt with depression a lot. And... I'm so happy that this year I've been able to build some things and stay really tactical. I hired a business coach. Like I'm trying my best to, and the business men, I hired a business mentor basically. And he just keeps me, holds me accountable. And God, it's so good to have an accountability partner, um, to deal with a lot of this stuff. It's actually why I started offering one-on-one -on -one mentorship because I want to be that for some kid. I made, I fucked up a lot in my life, you know, especially early in college. I made a lot of mistakes and even in my professional career, still making a lot of mistakes with like the person I was. And it took me a long time to realize like, man, if I want to really maximize my life and do something cool and be my own boss, like I got to start working, start doing something that's more fulfilling, you know, and not just rely on like smoking nicotine or drinking or smoking weed. Like that stuff was, you know, actually a big part of my life for a while, not really drinking, but the other things for sure. Um, but more so just being a party kid, you know? And so that's like how I dealt with a lot of that stuff. Not that I was thinking I've had a fucking blast doing it. It's not that I was just using it as a way to escape, but what you realize is you do it long enough. And for me, I'm like, I just burn out on things. You know, I go super hard on something that I love. And then, you know, you get older and you're like, damn, that didn't really serve me in any positive way other than it was fun, you know, but it didn't change like who I am. It didn't change me like taking steps towards building something to be my own boss or to, 
be an entrepreneur or to figure out who am I outside of volleyball? You know, what else do I have to offer the world? How can I help? How can I serve the world? It's not just fucking about me anymore, you know, and that's where I'm at now. Um, and that came from a place of being like, I am balling out in volleyball. I'm living in Cannes on the beach. This is the most beautiful place I've ever played other than Hawaii. Um, and yet I was depressed and it took a lot of self-reflection and being self-aware to be like, okay, it's not, I'm not, it's, it's fulfilling when you like have a good game and the night after the game, like all that, that high, right? And that was me searching for highs. And that was my high it was like playing good is a fucking high and it feels great, you know? And then <clears throat> it fades off. And then the next day is you got six more days until the next game. And then you got a lot of nights alone away from your girlfriend, away from your family, away from your friends. Um, you got a lot of downtime. What are you doing? Watching Netflix, playing video games. And Hey, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But I'll tell you one thing, like, you're going to get over it, you know, it's the same, it's the same, someone tried to give me, give them their kid advice about like partying. And it's so hard for me to do because I'm like, dude, go party, party yourself into a fucking grave, man. Okay. Not, not actually death, but I mean like, go for it. You're going to learn your lesson. I had to, you know, I had, that's how I had to learn was just going all in on it and eventually getting sick of it. Cause you will, you just will. Most likely you will. Um, and you'll realize, shit, I need something else in my life to fulfill me. And you'll find it. All right, that was a little bit sidetracking around there. So I apologize, but that's what I think. Mental health, hell of a, hell of a subject. All right, what made you choose to play at Hawaii? I'll give the simple answer. Kind of <laughs> piggybacking a little bit. Um, I got in trouble for doing mushrooms and I got in trouble for smoking weed. And I got let go from UC Irvine by John Spraw. And then I got a second chance at Hawaii. And I fucked that up too. But then came back on the team and came full circle. And now look at us here. Bam. Okay. Favorite song to train to or type of music to listen to while training? Ah, do you know, I don't... I, I, I float around. I'm such a mood listener. I listen to whatever I'm in the mood for. Um, I will say one song. Let me see if I can find it. I don't know if I'm allowed to play music, dude. If this gets taken down because of this song, I'm gonna be so sad. But we're gonna play it anyways. Let's find it. It's from a. Uh, let me think of it. Yeah, La Cation, baby, La Cation. It's from actually uh, Ocean's Twelve, I think. Ocean's Thirteen. This is. I'm gonna play it for you. Let's see if you can play it. It's like this part of the song comes on. Ocean's Twelve. This is where the like. The guy starts like dancing through the lasers and he's just like fucking. Oh my god, this scene is. Dude, I'm getting chicken skin. You can't see it, but I'm getting chicken skin just from thinking about it. All the laser dancing. It's like fucking diving under lasers. Anyways, that song rips. Um, that song I actually like a lot because it's. And there's an instrumental version of it that I really like. Um, and I actually do that. Wow, so annoying. The camera overheated because it's near the window. Oh, all right, we're back. I know this is having so much, this this podcast journey, but you know what? We keep it rolling, baby. That's what we do. Keep it rolling. All right, next question by Mr. Stewart. Do you follow college volleyball? Quick answer. No, I do not. Um, no, I do not. I know in the States, college volleyball for men at least, is that's basically the NBA, right? I mean, what else is there? But guess what? The NBA is actually in Poland and in Italy and overseas. Um, and so it's a bummer that there's no easy way for college kids to, to look up to that or for other kids to look up to that because that's the big leagues. Um, and, you know, it's amazing when you're in college. Like when I went to Hawaii, I was like, <laughs> like, especially my junior, senior year, I started playing really well and was just felt unstoppable. And you're just like, I'm the shit. How could I ever get any better? And now I look back at like college film and I'm just like, oh, my God, dude. Like the difference between playing in college and overseas is like night and day. This game speed. Um, I think the biggest difference is like just little mistakes. Like overseas in the best leagues, like guys just don't make little stupid mistakes. And in college, of course, you're making a bunch of silly mistakes, you know, miscommunications and um, bad, more bad sets and guys just like trying to blast when you're like young out, the biggest thing we see, and I see it when young guys come to play overseas, they just want to smash balls. You know, they just want to smash and, uh, that just doesn't work. It just doesn't work when you're going against seven foot Polish dudes 
You can't just think you can smash every ball. You got to be smart. You got to be tactical. You got to learn to recycle. So no, I don't watch college volleyball. Bang. Next question by Apreya Sard 13. Do players get paid a lot of money depending on the position they play? Wow. What a question. Yeah. Let's just give you the dumbest, simplest answer. Opposites, outsides making the most money. Um, then probably setters, middle blockers, last position would be Libro. It really depends on the league you play into as well. Um, Russia pays good. Turkey pays good. Um, Japan, like Korea, all those places pay good. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, yes, yes. Video keeps fucking stopping because it's so hot near the window. Oh, that just means summer's coming, baby. Fuck it. We roll with it. Summer's coming and we're ready for you. Uh, I dare you. I dare you to overheat one more time. Um, we're just going straight back into it. I don't give a fuck. Yes. Outside opposites get paid. Depends what league you're on. Um, depends if you're a national team player or like how big of a player you're doing, like you are, what kind of work have you done? Um, all that to say middles are basically breadcrumb boys. That's me, a breadcrumb boy. I'm a breadcrumb boy. I'm a breadcrumb boy. Middles are breadcrumb boys. It's an Island Boys remix. Okay. Next thought here by Koyat. Uh, you think that a 5'10 guy that has a 40 inch vertical can play a middle? A fucking silly ass question. Yeah, why not? You got a 40 inch vertical. You could do anything you want. Um, will you succeed? I don't know. Guys, people just think if you jump high that you're going to succeed. And we have plenty of examples that that's not the case. Um, but coaches seem to love it. They see a guy with a big vertical. They start drooling a little bit. A little pee comes out, you know. But in the big leagues, we see little guys succeeding all the time because they're crafty and they're smart. And by little guys, I mean, yeah, probably more 6'3", six, 6'4", six, but that's little compared to, you know, 6'9". Um, so 5'10", yeah. I'm assuming, you know, you got sicky genetics. I'm assuming also you're probably like 10, 15 years old. Um, absolutely, I do. Oh, my God, my camera might die on us again. Dude, boy, I keep rolling. We keep it's steady over here. Next question by Austin Einhorn. The weirdest weird you've ever gone. What the fuck does that mean? What does that mean, Austin? I don't know how to respond to that. Don't know what it means. Next question. Well, I do love you, buddy. Uh, by Brad underscore Tima. If animals could talk, which one would be the rudest? Now we're getting into the good questions, baby. The deep thoughts. Uh... You know what would be what would be pretty cool is if sloths, like assuming everyone's, I don't know, spoke a language I understood. I think if, a, like I would love to see sloths being rude because I just imagine a sloth saying something super disrespectful, like, you know, your mother-in-law is a terrible driver. And then he just has to slowly get away, you know? Like what an amazing set of characteristics that you're insanely rude, but it takes you like so long to escape the scene. You know, you have to sit in this puddle of rudeness and awkwardness. Um, I think that'd be pretty cool. Also, no hate on women drivers there. You know, I feel like I got to back up everything I say. Okay, just came out. Mother-in-law could have been father-in-law. Get off my case. All right. Uh, next question by Jack D. DT Desert Island can only bring three albums. What's your pick? Um, well, this is an easy question. I'm definitely not bringing three fucking albums. If I'm going to a desert island, um, I'm bringing probably like an axe, you know? Uh, I'm going to bring some sunscreen because your boy's got pale skin, especially right now. God, right now for sure I need sunscreen. Zinc. I'll bring buckets of zinc. And, uh, you know, probably bring like some sort of metal straw. A, because it's environmentally friendly. And B, because if I do find coconuts, I just jam that straw in there. And now we got, you know, nature's milk. Next question if you could go back in time to your first year university self, what advice would you give? I kind of hit on this already. Um, honestly, I'd say go, 
keep doing what you're doing. And that's me telling the university self kid who just got kicked off two teams to continue. My point is it doesn't matter what advice I would give myself, you know, because I was the kid who just needed to learn the hard way. So it's like the advice I would have given myself wouldn't have really mattered, you know? And, uh, yeah, again, I'm just the kid that need to learn the hard way. So it's the advice I give to kids now too. It's like, Hey, you want to do that? Go ahead. Here's, here's some solutions. Here's what I think will happen. But if that's what you want to do, fucking go for it. You're going to learn. You know, I, I just think in some way it's so strange because I want to help those kids so bad. And there's so many people who deal with the same kind of addictive tendencies or just want to have fun. And dude, I'm all about having a good time, you know? And you know, you just hope that you don't make the same as I hope for kids. They don't make the same mistakes I did. Damn. I was so lucky. Cause I know kids who made the same mistakes who were known as the party kids in college and didn't make it out. Didn't get to play pro. Didn't get to finish playing in college. I got lucky. Um, I got a third chance and I took advantage of it, you know, and still had a good time and didn't get caught. Like, you know, it took me into my adulthood to realize like, okay, those things are super fun, but like, they're not filling this itch inside me that needs to be fulfilled and needs to do something great with my life, you know? Um, and you think that's playing professional volleyball and then you do it for a while and you're like, Oh no, I'm capable of so much more than that. Let's go explore that. And that you realize like some of those other things are, you have, you have to understand when is it a distraction and when is it just like, there's a time and a place for it. And for me, the only way to find moderation was to go overkill you know, to party so much that I was sick of it, to watch Netflix so much that I felt like a lazy piece of shit, you know, to like, like that's just my personality. And that's, thank God I did that because now I feel like I've found and I'm still finding such a great balance of those things and it's shaped who I am and who I'm becoming. And I love that. Um, so being self-aware is really big. Um, but you know, when you're young, you think you can get away with all of it and uh, it comes back to get you. That's for sure. So, you know, my advice is not if there's college kids listening to this, like fucking do what you want, you know, just know there's like, you don't need to wait to be a professional. You know, if you really want to play in the, the best leagues in the world and you want to compete on the national level, um, you got to make a lot of sacrifices, you know, and then there's some kids who they're just so naturally gifted and they don't need to, and they can get away with partying and whatever, you know, but let me tell you something. I know a lot of them and they're not fulfilled. I just could tell you that right now with full confidence. Um, so, you know, you got to find your balance and only, you know what that looks like. And when you're a kid, you don't know shit. When you're 19, you don't know shit about yourself yet. So I'm fucking 30 and I'm still learning, man. I'm just learning like important values, core values for who I am. So, and that'll never stop. I hope, you know, I hope that just keeps going. All right. Next question. What's the worst? God damn it, dude. All these volleyball questions. What's the worst part of professional volleyball? Uh, I mean, just the worst part is, I mean, we've already been over this. I don't, this is not meant to be depressing. Playing professional volleyball is a fucking dream and I absolutely love it. And I'm so grateful to get to do this for a living. There's no doubt in my mind. Um, but the worst part is being away from my girlfriend, being away from my friends, being away from my community, you know, like being away from People speaking my language, I speak like a broken English for most of the day until I call someone from back home, you know, or I speak to a TJ, the other American guy here, you know, so you I swear to God, I feel like it makes me stupider and I already am walking a line here, a very thin line. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I think, yeah, just the worst part is it's like anything, you know, you miss home, you miss fuck. I would love, I wish uh, this was on the beach where I could surf every day. Wouldn't that be great where all my best friends are? Um, and you just, you got to figure out where to sacrifice things in life. Um, but that's the worst part. And also the best part in some way, you know, you, you really learn to sit with yourself and hopefully if you don't just consistently distract yourself with bullshit, you're able to like reflect on who you are and learn about yourself. And that only comes from trying things that are, you know, outside your comfort zone, honestly, like this kind of shit doing a podcast. I don't want to fucking do this. I'm answering all these questions. Actually I do. I really want to communicate with people, but like, who's going to listen to this? How many people? Um, is it really helpful? You know, could I have answered the question better? All things I think about when this podcast is over and I either listen to it or don't. Um, just being like, oh, that I could have said this different or done this different or I was kind of tired or like right now I'm fucking hyped up on caffeine and I had a pancake with tons of sugars on it. 
natural sugar, but still, um, you know, and, uh, now I'm not answering the question at all. So let's continue. Uh, what was it like? This is by Tony Lichilim. What was it like to be tall as a kid Dude, being tall as a kid is fucking sweet. Let me tell you that. And I know a lot of you don't get to experience that, but let me just fill you in on something. Being tall as a kid is, is pretty great. I was actually looking at old for Christmas. We went back home for Christmas and I was looking at old photos and it's just like all these kids in a line and then just this giant blonde head sticking out. And then everyone else back at like, you know, three feet in kindergarten, everyone was three feet and daddy was over here like 10 feet tall. Um, <laughs> no, but being tall is great. And it's also awful, right? Because you're, you're like, at least for me, I was like tall and athletic as a kid. So I was the best at things. And to be honest, it made me super competitive and it made me kind of a bitch, you know, where I had to fucking win all the time because that's what I do. That's what you do when you're taller than everyone else. I always played up a level, you know? Um, so being a tall kid, is pretty sweet. Uh, it's pretty sweet when you get to pass down your clothes to your older brother because he's fucking shorter than you. That's a good feeling. Oh my God, my camera's going to die again. Here we go. Keep it going. What's the biggest shock to you when you went pro? The level, the game speed. It's just so different than college volleyball. Um, it's so much more intense. So many things that, again, I break down in the blocking course. Um, I think we'll start to give you an idea of what's happening at the pro level and where you can find a ways to fit it into your level and start to progress to hopefully go to play at the highest level. Um, next question. Also, do you think if a T-Rex also, why did you start the question out with also? If you, uh, do you think if a T-Rex fell down, would it be able to stand back up or just die on the floor? What fucking kind of question is that? Of course it would like, dude, T-Rexes are like the gnarliest dinosaur that roamed thy earth. You think T-Rex's worst enemy was if they tripped and fell over and couldn't get back up? Give me a fucking break, dude. T-Rexes would just be on the floor like this, fucking eating anything near it, you know? Um... Honestly, T-Rexes probably were like, had other animals as slaves, like slave animals, you know, were like, pick me the fuck up, you know, or I will fuck up your entire village. That's, a, that's, a, that's how I imagine T-Rexes. All right, last question. Here we go. Alex J. Richards, what do you do when you feel like you're in a slump with volleyball or a plateau? Um, get curious. You got to get curious. Um, you got to... Find ways to get tactical, not to overthink how you're playing. Um, staying tactical is just the advice I can give you for anything in your life. Just stay tactical. You want to get better. You're having a slump. You're getting blocked more. You're just not playing well. Um, just focus on like watch some film. Focus on what can you get better at and just tactically do it. You know, do you need to get a little stronger? Maybe you do an extra session in the weight room. Do you need to get um, focus more on your health? Stay after practice. Show up early. Um, you know, are you having problems in reception? Show up early, get reps, stay later, get reps, find creative ways to get better. Um, a lot of this to me is like how coaches design practice, but assuming you don't have any control of that and assuming it's probably pretty boring. Um, you gotta, you gotta realize like that your future's in your hands, grab it, you know, go get it. And, uh, easier said than done, but you know, if, if you can learn to really just be tactical, it will, you will get better and you won't be judging yourself based on if you played good or played bad. You'll judge yourself. Like for my, for example, for myself in serving, I judge myself on what was my attitude? Was my attitude? Fuck. I just missed the last serve. Put this one in. Was I a little timid? Was I a little scared? Or was I like, I'm going to fucking hit this guy. Good toss. Go for it. Bad toss. Roll it in. Be smart and tactical. And that's how I judge myself, you know? You see all the time people serve the ball and they like miss hit it and it goes in and the coach is like, well, a point is a point. Like, fuck that shit. It's you try to hit the target. Did you, if you miss, you think about the feeling of why it felt different and you go to like judge your, start to judge yourself based on being on, on your own tactics and how you feel, um, like how things felt, try to remember how things feel. Um, but yeah, we're I guess we're getting a little off topic. Tactical. Be a soldier, baby. Be a volleyball, a little volleyball soldier. All right, those are all the questions. Um, I don't know if this is helpful. If you guys like the Q&A stuff, let me know. Uh, last time I used this Sony whatever the fuck camera, this thing sucks, dude. I can't believe it died on me like five times during this. Um, but we kept it rolling, baby. We kept it rolling. We're gonna put it out there. You know we're putting it out there. 
Um, but anyways, if you guys find this stuff super helpful, awesome, let me know because some of, sometimes I answer these questions and I, I feel like I'm answering and saying the same things over and over again. I'd like to have new conversation, talk about different things. Um, maybe I just need to go more into depth on like one subject to keep things simple. Um, if you guys got ideas for this podcast, people you want me to interview, things you want me to dive deeper into, let me know. I'm here to share my experience. I'm here to share my story. I'm here to take this motherfucker to the moon. Um, and that's what I want to do. So, uh, and, and I do want to say those, for those of you who have reached out, it's actually super helpful. I've had multiple national team players and just professional players reach out. Man, that stuff is so cool to hear really because uh you know uh a lot of times i'm like what am i doing like why am i filming this i'm just doing saying the same shit over and over again uh, and just like that the camera dies on me again so congratulations sony you guys suck uh let's get out of here this was great if you love it let me know i want to serve this community so let's keep things rolling if you have someone you want to see on here let me know we'll get them on um, if you want to sponsor me, sponsor me, dude, I'm right now. The fuck it. We're getting sponsored by We're gonna get sponsored by a peanut butter company. That's my goal. Actually, I would love to be sponsored by a peanut butter company. Let's just, let's let this thing fly to the moon, baby. Let's all do it together. Huh? We all share it together. Uh, wouldn't you love to go under Robin hood and just see tallest podcast on earth stock. You can invest in it. Well, invest baby. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. See you later.